Shalom. Shalom. Welcome to Betar El Messianic Congregation. You know, I just want to tell you that a source of, of joy for me, a source of, of, of faith, is when I hear what, what the Lord has done in people's life during the week. You know, uh, you know, Nina tells me that two people came to the Lord. This is great, right? Two people this week. This is what it's all about, right? I got a phone call for Anna this week, and very excited. I said, What's, what happened, Anna? I just spoke the word to a man. That's great. This is what it should be, and so on and so forth. This is good. And also, you know, this week, uh, they went out to give out Bibles. There, there was only one group. I was with them. I was the driver again. And... Um, you know, this week was special. I tell you why. They gave three sets, but they stayed a long time in two houses, right? 45 minutes in one, and an hour almost in another. And I got actually a little, you know, scared. I mean, where were the people? But the, the point is, you know, they spoke to a uh, Holocaust survivor, you know, who actually wrote a book, and they have the book, and they're going back to see him next week. Pray for him. Holocaust survivor from Montreal. You know, this is great. So a lot of work is being done, and this is a great joy for us. So, and let's not forget, there's a baptism on the 30th of this month, June. If you haven't been baptized, come and see me. We can talk uh, about it. So let's open up our scriptures to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Today we'll be covering the last verses of the book of Daniel. You know, it's always sad to end the study of a book of the Bible. You know, for when we dig deeper into any part of the scriptures, we often discover its great depth. And so, for my part, I leave this study with a feeling that I know less than when I began. You're right? This is, this is, I want to tell you, the power of the Word of God. Its study is endless, and so are the blessings that flow from it. But Daniel is not going anywhere, right? It's still in our Bible, and we can read it over and over, right? So far, this last chapter, 12, contains some considerable teachings, all packed in 13 verses. It begins by mentioning Michael the angels. Since the 10th chapter, this book has opened up the angelic world like no other book in the Hebrew Scriptures. It taught us that, that countries are led either by good or evil angels. Now we can understand. We can understand some of their evil acts in history. As it is on earth, confrontations are always taking place there, it seems. And the 12th chapter brings us right to the greatest battle yet ever fought. And this last confrontation, the Bible tells us, will take place right here on earth. All of it. For demons will be confined here for the last three and a half years. And so fierce it would be that we're given these, these astonishing words. You remember the first verse of Daniel 12. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. This must be one of the harshest sentences in the scriptures. But as, as it is with such expression in the scriptures, it's always followed by a positive note. But here, even the positive is different. So unlike what we have seen before. Well, we're told that right after that, at that time, your people shall be delivered. It is not all of them, not all of Israel, not all of the world. It is only those found in the book of life. And for the first time, if you remember, a double resurrection is mentioned. And there it lists those places in the hereafter where each man will go either into one or the other. It clearly says it. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The first group will go to everlasting life the first time where, where these words are mentioned are here. And the other will go to everlasting shame and contempt. What are these words? You know, today they, they would say that it's so un-Jewish to speak this way. But what determine what is Jewish is very much the scriptures. And there it is. Heaven and hell. It is described for us. The closing words of the last chapter begins in verse 4. And there again, there, there's so much that the Spirit has kept for the end. Here we will be looking at the heart and feeling of Daniel and that of the angels as well. Because they, they felt also, and they had questions, they felt it's the end, and they had their questions as well. And each actually asked a question. The angels wanted to know how long with all this last. And Daniel wanted to know what is going to happen to his people, Israel. For, for the war to come is so fierce that he says, but what's going to happen? This is when Jesus appears again with some great and comforting words, you know, for them and for us as well. Now let us begin to read the text. And again, it is my prayer that these words will bless our heart knowing that in whichever circumstances... Our God is with us. This is what we're going to pull out of this passage. Our God is always with us. Verse 4. 
And it says, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So when Daniel is told to conceal this word, he's not told to hide the book somewhere, for the Bible is open for everyone to read. What we're told here is that the meaning of these words can only be understood until their time of fulfillment, until the end time. And it's only after 2,500 years that today we're beginning to see, to understand these prophecies, not fully yet, not fully, but enough to see that these elements spoken of are taking form in our lifetime and telling us that Yeshua is so close. In his study of the book of Daniel, the 17th century scientist Isaac Newton understood this point. This is what he wrote. He says, about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will pay a turn attention to the prophecies and insist on their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. His observation based on the passages we're looking in today Actually, we're right, for the knowledge of prophecy is progressive, meaning that as we come closer to the end, more of the scriptures will be revealed to us. And a powerful promise is given at the end of the verse. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. In the context of Daniel, this speaks of the knowledge of prophecy. The, the word knowledge has an article in there, the knowledge, hadaat, right? It points to the understanding of this word, which will increase as time flows. So we're living, actually, in very, very exciting times. But is it not interesting that now, today, the study of prophecy is being left out by the greater majority of the Protestant churches? God is opening up the Bible, and they turn their heads away from it. They're missing the boat. They did the same thing at the time of Noah. Until, as Jesus says, as a prophecy of what will happen. He says in Matthew 24, the, until the day Noah entered the ark, and there Genesis tells us that God closed the door. But thank God that many, it says, many will go back and forth. That is, will search the scriptures and will find great and blessed things. However, some have seen another reference to this prophecy. For the words, many shall run to and fro, some understood men's ability to travel today all over the world, all over our planet. And in the word knowledge shall increase, they see the massive amount of information that is available today. It is true. It is true that for the first time in history, men now can travel to and fro throughout the planet at a very fast pace. Our planet has become like a village where everyone knows each other and knows what the other is doing. And it seems that this was a necessary thing for, for the leadership and rule of the Antichrist to come. We're told he will rule the whole planet. He needs that thing. The words to and fro are from one word in the Hebrew, sut, which means to roam, to, to wander about a fast pace. So when the scribes of the Dead Sea Scroll translated this verse in Daniel, they wrote that the people will go absolutely aimlessly in the context of this chapter. This actually is a good translation. The Septuagint sees it negatively as well. It renders it, many shall rave violently and the earth will be filled with unrighteousness. So our world is experiencing changes in view of the final prophecies to happen. Now, did you know that any at any given moment, there are about 5,000 commercial planes in the sky over North America. And there's approximately an average of 102 or 103,000 daily flights around the world. You know, that's progress. That's progress, but we ought to remember that all these things is in correlation to the end times. The Hebrew definition to roam, to wander about at a fast pace also reminds me when I'm in an airport. It's a hectic place where people are going and going at a fast pace. I often think of Daniel 12, 4 when I see them. And for those flights that I often take, for instance, to Vancouver, the plane, big Dreamliner, actually is almost full, always full, that is, always full. And I like to go to the airports a few hours before so I can take my time, and you never know. You know, a few weeks ago, on our way to Israel, we, we, have to, we have to take a plane from Montreal to Toronto, then Toronto to Tel Aviv. 
When we arrived in Montreal at the end of the line, we were greeted by an agent who happened to be an, an old acquaintance of mine. We were happy to see each other, but when he saw our tickets, he noticed that we did not have an assigned seating, which means that we were on standby, and these planes are always full to capacity. So he took it upon himself to go behind the counter to find out that, in fact, all seats were taken because also the airline changed the plane to a smaller one. The other one wasn't functional. So we were going to miss our flight to Israel. Our friend then brought us to another counter, I believe only for first class. Okay, he puts us in front of the line to try to have us put in an earlier flight to Toronto because we've come earlier. After at least half an hour on the phone, phone calls and negotiation, the lady on the other side of the counter finally got us on an earlier flight. It was, I believe, the last two seats. Okay. See, I just want to tell you, it pays to go a little earlier. Something that I'm trying to convince Sharon now, you know, and all the time, right? And today, this is the way to beat the prophecy of this hectic going to and fro. And I thank God, by the way, we, we met this friend. I have not seen him for many years. In fact, I didn't recognize him. It took me some time to recognize him. God does great things, doesn't he, right? One more thing about these words, to and fro. I have shared this with you before. These words helped me to go over my fear of flying. Would you believe that? I used to have this fear until I realized that it is prophecy for men to travel to and fro, so I concluded that God will make sure that the plane will fly, and miraculously, the fear came out. It worked, right? It is, in fact, an act of faith, really, to enter a plane, okay? At least if we were introduced to the pilot so we can see his credentials, right? All you see is a steel door. You don't know who's there. Maybe there's nobody, right? <laughs> And here we're entering a sort of massive building with a basement full of gasoline, gasoline really, a building which flies, okay? While I respect engineers and pilots, I rather put my faith in God, and it works wonderful. He said, we will go to and fro, and he makes it possible, right? So it's good. As for the other part of the prophecy, knowledge shall increase. It fits this massive amount of knowledge everyone today has access to, the internet, right? Today is not so much getting knowledge, but knowing how to use this great amount of information that is available to us. According to the Journal of Business Education, if a chemist or, or, or physicist sat down to, to read the scientific journals in his field as his full-time job, at the end of the year, he would be three months behind in his readings. Okay? There's always new things that are being uh, found, right? And the internet has an answer to almost any questions you ask, which at times is very helpful. But the problem is that many have become experts in many fields. My doctor actually complained that many have become their own doctors. Okay? They say that now 72% of internet users go goes online for health information, and slightly scarier, 50% of doctors do the same, so it helps them too. <laughs> and when it comes to religion, when it comes to theology, right, have you seen how many improvise themselves as Bible experts right away, right? They, they pull a string here and another there like magicians and come up with new theories, new dates, right? And especially when it comes to the end times. Just yesterday, you know, I plugged the word end times on Google, and I got 3 billion, 700 million results. What are you going to do with this, right? This new, there's a new term, by the way, for this type of information. It's information overload. This is what they call it. Or infobesity, right? Terms used to describe the difficulty of understanding an issue and effectively making decision when one has too much information about this issue. This is what we need more and more wisdom from God, and God promises this wisdom. The Lord has promised this wisdom, in fact, in verse 3, to help us to find our way into these mazes of information. He spoke of those who are wise, if you remember. That is, those who know how to divide the real from the unnecessary the, and the real from the fake. The Hebrew words, by the way, is masculine, right? Masculine, the title of the masculine, by the way, became one of honor in many parts of Judaism and even became a name of a new movement in Judaism in the 1800s, a movement which moved away from rabbinical Judaism. However, the wise in this context is the one who loves the word of God and believes that there's no mistake in it, that it is completely inspired by the Holy Spirit. And to these, I believe the Lord will give insight and wisdom. Right? 
And the Bible gives us the way to manage and acquire this knowledge. It's not only to search the internet or have all the commentaries and lexicon. See what Jesus says. Something important he says in John 7, 17. These, by the way, are the passwords to the internet. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know the teaching. Whether it is from God or whether I speak of myself. This is the key to understanding the scriptures. Do the will of God. Actions. Action. Follow the precepts of love and obedience. And the future actually will open up to you. So God sees the heart, not so much how much we know. If we abide in him, you will know his teaching. This is how he reveals his will. Seek him from all your heart and your mind and the Bible will open up. Now, all these promises are a great encouragement, especially, especially they will be for those who will undergo the tribulation, because there are some great things in there. God will be so present with them, and this is what the rest of the chapter actually emphasizes. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Then I, Daniel, looked, and these stood two others, one on the river bank and the other on, on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Here we are brought to the final scene of the book. Daniel sees two angels, and he recognizes the man in linen. He, he met him back in chapter 10. And you know who it is? It is Yeshua himself who comes to close the book of Daniel. You will recognize him as well. If you go to Daniel 10, just a couple of pages behind, verses 5 and 6, this is the description of Yeshua. He says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with gold of Euphas. And verse 6, his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished browns in color, and the sound of his words were like the voice of a multitude. You know, this description is almost identical as that that we have in Revelation chapter 1, when he appeared to John, who also was at the edge of the tribulation. And in chapter 10, he is dressed in linen and gold, Pure gold, the linen which was worn by the priest, reminds us of his priestly office and the gold of his office of king. But here in chapter 12, he seems to appear only in his linen robe, for it is a time when Yeshua will be so involved as a high priest, protecting his people, Jews and Gentiles, from the wrath to come. And it is here where one angel asks a question, and Yeshua answers in a most powerful way. His question is at the end of verse 6. It says of chapter 12, he says, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Right? First we see that from an in, the angel point of view, all these prophecies he calls wonders. The Hebrew is Pele. That is something marvelous, something wonderful. For if we are passionate about the end time, the angels even more. And they are so eager to know as well, because not everything is revealed to them, it seems. There's an anticipation in heaven. They also are waiting for a blessed hope, their own blessed hope. Theirs will be the end of sin. And see that, like us, they don't know the future. And they are excited to know about it. Jesus told us so. Do you remember when? In Matthew 24, when he says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. They don't know, so they ask Yeshua. Now, there's something beautiful here, something really great. If we're told that only the Father knows, why are they asking the Son? If in Matthew 24, Jesus said that only the Father knows, why are they asking Him? He clearly says that no one knows, not even the angels, but only the Father. The reason why they're asking is because Yeshua already said they know. I and the Father are one. Up there in heaven, I want to tell you they have no problem with the Trinity. Well, only here, right? And the question then is, how long, right? Ratmatai, they, they did not know yet how long this time of wrath will last. Gabriel spoke of seven years in chapter 9. He spoke of the, of the middle week when the sacrifices and offerings will end and when the abomination will be set up. And this is where Jesus takes over and adds one more information. Verse 7, see what he says. 
Then I heard the man clothed in linen, that is our Lord here, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by life eternal that it shall be for a time, times and half a time. And when the power of the holy people shall be completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. First, see how Yeshua answers the question for the duration of the time of wrath. He begins by raising both hands to take an oath, to swear by it. This, I want to tell you, is the first time two hands are raised. Usually only one hand is raised. But the matter is so dear to him, for his beloved are going to be persecuted. So he raised both hands to confirm and affirm that he will be present with them, with each one of them. And the text emphasizes the movement. It could have said that he raised both hands. Or that he lifted up his hands. But it is more precise. He lifted up his right hand. And he lifted up his left hand. And there we're told that he swore by him who lives forever. Right? The last words are not easy to translate. The Hebrew has ben hai ha raolam. Right? Literally life eternal. As the rabbi translated. He swore by life eternal. This is the first time by the way we encounter this title again. But see, it is not addressed to the Father or the Ancient of Days, nor to any of the members of the Trinity. These titles seem to include the whole Trinity. It must be all of them engaged in protecting the people during the tribulation. For he had already been told that Yeshua is divine. For the angel recognized that he knows the time. So he could only swear by who he is, right? Here, I believe, it is the divine who swore by himself. Just like we have it in Hebrews 6.13. Where it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Here Yeshua swears by himself who is the eternal life giver as each member of the Trinity. Isn't that an awesome scene that we're seeing here? So what is the promise here? First, that it will last Two and a half years. First, let me show you the, this map, right? You, you're all aware of it. Just to tell you where we are. Okay, first of all, these are the 70 weeks of Daniel in here. And you know where we are? Right here. Okay, church age. We're about to end it. And we're about to take it up in rapture. The three and a half years, this is the last three and a half years that Jesus is speaking about. Right, the last one here, and then comes the messianic age or the millennium. Let's focus on these three and a half years. From this point, actually, this is the three and a half years are mentioned six times. Six times. Here in Revelation 12 14, it repeats times and times and half a time. In Revelation 11 2 and 13 5, two times it says 42 months, which is exactly three and a half years. And two times it says 1260 days. Right, six times in all, so that we know that it would be three and a half years. This is why Jesus swears here. Nowhere, by the way, in history could someone find an event which corresponds to the seven and three and a half years after which Jesus comes. It is still future. Well, today they reinterpret these times and times and half a times as an unknown time, so they allegorize it. This is, I want to tell you, another sign of the end times. For this is new. It was not like this before, along with ancient rabbis who read the word literally. The church fathers also interpreted the three and a half years literally. We have to know this, that today they're giving a new information, new interpretation of the scriptures. Theodore of Sire from the fourth century, Hippolytus from the third century, Jerome, well known from the fourth century, and even Augustine from the 4th century, who is thought to have introduced the allegorization method. They all read the Bible and understood that it was exactly 1260 days. And even Porphyry, the 3rd century, the one who who attacked the book of Daniel and said that it was written after the facts, he read the three and a half years as being literal. And today we have this new masculine who have a self-gifted, superior knowledge of the Bible who arrogantly changed the word of God. For them, the number means nothing, as the number thousand years, which now means nothing or anything you want. And the 1260 days and the 42 days means nothing anymore. But the Bible is clear. And Jesus swore by these three and a half years. 
the last part of the tribulation will be no more than three and a half years. Now let us not forget that this is a closing scene. While Jesus is taking an oath, there are two angels present and Daniel, that is, which makes it three, for we were told that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, the matter is settled, and so it is. And the last words of verse 7 gives us an indication of the purpose of the final war, the tribulation. Why would God allow such a terrible time? Jesus actually tells us. He says, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, and these things shall be finished, right? What does that mean? What power of Israel, the holy people, is spoken of right here? The word for power, by the way, is yad, hand or arm, right? And the word chattered means to complete something. This is what it means. It can be negative as to chatter and break something, or positive, as to finish, for instance, the tabernacle as it is used in Exodus 39. I believe that the word takes both meanings here. Those who will go to everlasting shame and contempt will be chattered. Those who will go to everlasting life will be built up. In any case, a new Israel will emerge, and then they will walk under the arm of the Lord, the Messiah, no more under their own yeah, their own arm. Now we go to the other question. This one is from Daniel. Let's read verse 8 and see the heart of the prophet. It says, Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? What was Daniel asking here? What did he not understand really, right? I think he, this question, his concern goes much deeper. This, we can understand it by the answer Yeshua gives him. What we may not have, he may not have, have understood is how severe the time would be. As a prophet of God who shared his deep love for his people, he could not have forgotten the words at the beginning of the chapter, which says there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. We also cannot understand this. And so he asked, what shall be the end of these things? Daniel's question is like that of Habakkuk, when he saw the same thing. He says, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? Or, or when John, when he felt all these things, he wept. He wept after seeing that no one could open up the seal. And Jesus appeared. That was only the, by the microphone, right? <laughs> So Daniel, Habakkuk, and John were confronted with the reality of the end times, and they both voiced their pains, really, here. So what Daniel must be asking is, w would there be any survivors? Would there be anybody left, right? He saw the angel asking, actually, when it will stop. And that, actually, by the way, it did not help. He must have felt completely alone, seeing the questions also of the angels. Now Yeshua answers and in so doing gives two more prophecies showing that he will be there in the tribulation walking with the people. Now before he gives his answer, he speaks directly to Daniel. Look at chapter 9, or th that is verses 9 and 10. And he says, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall be wickedly, shall, be, shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Go, he says, lach, Daniel. Like saying, don't worry, Daniel. Do not worry, right? First, these prophecies were not for the people of Israel then. You know, he, he, must, have, uh, have, he must have been his concern about his own people then. And here, for the second time, he tells them the purpose of the tribulation. The first was in verse 7. We just saw the people's power, yad, will be chattered or built. Here he gives more detail. First, many shall be purified, made white and refined. As in the word shattered before. These are the ones who will be built up, purified, refined, and ready for the messianic times. Sometimes, by the way, it takes a tribulation to refine some people, right? However, see that Yeshua, what he says next. He says, but the wicked shall do wickedly, right? The racharim, that is the, is, is the same word that, by the way, that Jesus used in, on the Sermon on the Mount when he said, whoever says to his brother, Rasha, right? But these here are the real Rashaim. 
And the Hebrew word is repeated twice, as if to say that the wicked will become more wicked as time goes on. Do you remember that prophecy? We see it all over the New Testament, especially in 2 Timothy 3, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And it began 2,000 years ago with the birth of the church, but it will increase as we move closer to the end. And now we learn that it reaches its zenith at the time of the tribulation. And he adds at the end, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise, the wise shall understand. So we should expect two things. First, an increase of wickedness. And second, an increase of the understanding of the end time prophecy as time moves towards the end. All these things are in accord, by the way, of the rest of the New Testament. So we are three verses from the end of Daniel, but it's not yet over. Again, the best wine is served last. It is now that Jesus gives yet another prophecy. Look at verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Here Yeshua gives some very precious and valuable information for those who will be present during the seven-year tribulation. He speaks of 1290 days, which is 30 more days than the 1260 days of the three and a half years, right? Where shall we put them, right? Where then shall we place these 30 extra days, at the beginning or at the end of the 1260 days? And the second question is, for what purpose were they given? The majority of modern commentators place these 30 days at the end of the tribulation along with an extra 45 days in the next verse and speak of 75 days in between the tribulation and the millennium for at this time there will be a judgment of the nations actually that we see in Matthew 25 but none explain why it is divided into 30 and 45 ancient rabbis actually and church fathers see the numbers differently while each gave different reasons they place the 30 days before the tribulation and the 45 days at the end of the tribulation Ibn Ezra saw it before the destruction of the temple, before the abomination of desolation. Jerome also puts it first well. He says, for he is going to persecute the saints for three and a half years or 1290 days. For him, the text here gives a more exaggeration. And what is interesting is that these church fathers' commentaries is that while they, they lived in, in the years 200 or 400 AD, they all expected the temple to be rebuilt, by the way. And this is what is happening in Israel, right? We know that. So to put the 30 days before makes perhaps more sense, not only in the reading, but in the light of what Yeshua did and says in verse 10. If he swore that the wrath of God will not exceed 1260 days, three and a half years, we need to put the 30 days before the abomination of desolation. But what is the purpose of these 30 days? The time fits other prophecies. It must be a time given to believers to flee to the mountains. Remember Jesus' warning in Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Referring to the text, actually, we're studying today. He says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, we'll find it very hard to flee in wartime. So a time perhaps is given to them of 30 days for this. And what will, be the, what will mark the beginning of these 30 days? Matthew and Daniel say the same thing. The abomination of desolation, the setting up of the abomination of desolation. You know what the abomination of desolation is? By the way, it's not easy to figure out. At the time of Antiochus, it describes the moment when he, 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 Antiochus raised the statue of Zeus in the temple of God. And the Jews then called it the abomination of desolation. As for the Antichrist, we don't know exactly, but we have an indication. It won't be a statue, actually, that he will set up. He will set up himself. This is what Paul tells us. He, the Antichrist, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the, the zenith, the apex of, of, of sin itself, of pride. Perhaps he will enter the temple and take it over, showing himself as God. See how, by the way, the scriptures prepares the people for the tribulation. But there are other clues, other signs. Here, Daniel also says that at this time, the sacrifices will stop. So there are two things, the stopping of the sacrifices and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. Yet there's another sign as well that Jesus gives. 
In Luke 21, he says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And so what do we have? We have all in all four signs that are given before anything happens, right? The signing of the covenant in Daniel 9. The taking away of the daily sacrifice. The abomination of the desolation it's setting up. And the army surrounding Jerusalem, the, actually the believers will have everything. All the time they need to move away. I just want to see, what I see here is how God is so considerate. The believers there will, be left, will not be left to themselves. God has often, by the way, provided a time to flee, a time to consider the prophecies and put them in effect. You know, the same prophecy of Luke 21 saved the Messianic Jews, if you remember, from the Roman destruction in Jerusalem in 70 AD. You know that 1,100,000 Jews died in 70 AD, but no Messianic Jews. Why? Because they all left. It was in the year 66 AD that the first Jewish revolt broke out against the Romans. The governor of the regions, Sergius Gallus, surrounded Jerusalem to put an end to the revolt, but he wasn't strong enough. He had only 20,000 soldiers with him. And so he moved away. And so two years later, okay, they came back. They came back, you know, with the Roman general Vespasian and his son Titus and destroyed Jerusalem. But in between, the Jews believed, the Messianic Jews believed the prophecy and they moved away. And so these prophecies in Daniel, given by Yeshua as well, will play the same role for the people of the tribulation. They need to believe the word of God. And there is another time period of respite that is given before the three and a half years begin. And this one is in Revelation chapter 8. Do you remember that? 8.1, it says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for how long? About half an hour, right? We are here at the time of the three and a half years were about to start. So the same time as in Daniel 12, we see that there too was given a time, but for what was given a time of half an hour in heaven? Okay, The reason is powerful. You know why? For prayer. For prayer. Heaven In heaven, it says so, by the way, in the next verse. He says, then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. The golden censer was from the altar of incense, which symbolizes prayer, and so that he should offer for the prayer of the saints. So this half hour corresponds to the 30 days on earth. They must have been praying for the believers in there. Isn't that beautiful? You know, I'm not saying that half an hour in heaven corresponds to 30 days on earth, right? What I'm saying is that the situation corresponds. So we know what will happen. We know when. But the Bible also tells the believer where to go exactly. You know, uh, Micah, Isaiah, twice Isaiah, and Habakkuk tells the believers where to go. We read it, actually, it would be in Petra, Bozrah. Okay, the, it's very clear, Isaiah says, actually, that it would be in this region that the Messiah would come first to take his believers and then go to uh, Jerusalem. Okay, and we read in Revelation 12 that the woman Israel fled into the wilderness where she, it, she, was, she had a place prepared by God for 1260 days. This is the place where they would go. That is the place. You know, someone asked a very good question the other day. Well, why is the address given? Because if you read what Isaiah says, okay, and the others, they tell you exactly where it is. Well, just want to tell you, we had already, that is, if Satan knows the address, he will go there, right? But he had already shown that even if he knew an address, he could not find it, you know? Do you remember where we read in, John, in Jude, verse 9? that the devil contended with Michael and disputed the body of Moses. Perhaps he wanted to make a shrine of idolatry if people really knew where Moses was. Yet the address is given. In Deuteronomy 34, 6, it says, And he buried Moses in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. But no one actually where the grave knows where the grave is, right? See how precise the address is? But he could not find it. In the same way, he could not find the place in Petra. I know that a lot of believers go to Petra and put Bibles there. It's good. But we don't know where the place is, right? 
Through, so through this question asked in this chapter, we know how long it will be? Three and a half years. When? When the sacrifice at the temple will stop and the abomination of desolation will be set up. From other section of the Bible, we know where? In Petra or Bosra. We don't know. Actually, we cannot find it. You know that Google map doesn't work in Israel too well, right? Remember when we were in Jerusalem, uh, we put the Google, the address, it never showed us where to go. We were 300 feet from the address, they said, you arrived, okay? It's protected, it's protected. And also from other sections of the Bible, the believers is given more information as to when, when the armies actually will surround Jerusalem, just leave, leave Judea. Now what about the 45 days in verse 12? It says, look at verse 12, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,345 days. Blessed is the one who waits, the one who overcomes and comes to the 1,335 days. Now that is 45 days, more than 1,260 days. It is during this time that the judgment of the nations found in Matthew 25 will take place, I believe. At the same time, that of Israel as well, because we read in Ezekiel 20 that I will purge the rebel from among you before they enter actually the millennium. And why choose the number 45? Well, we do not know yet, but we know that this number is meaningful in Judaism and actually is believed to represent those who will enter the messianic times. In one commentary on Hosea chapter 3 verse 2, when the prophet symbolically buys back his wife from idolatry, as God will take back Israel at the end of the three and a half years, for the situation in both passages are the same. There the verse in Hosea reads, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half omer of barley. So the number 45 is arrived by adding the 30 measures represented by the omer of barley to the 15 measures represented by half Omer of barley. Follow me, this is great here. So we have in this verse 45 measures of barley, but listen to their own conclusion. This is what they said. This number 45 represents the righteous man who, whose ongoing merit made God enter into and keep his covenant with Israel. It fits so well, by the way. And barley, by the way, is the first fruit that are harvested after Passover and offered as the first fruit at the resurrection. Let us now look at the last verse, a very great promise to the prophet who has shown for over 80 years his steadfastness to God. He says, but as for you, go your way to the end, then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Go Daniel, he says, and rest. The word is Noah, right? Which means see, settle down. For the, he ran the race actually faithfully, and God promises that at the end, he will resurrect him. This promise is for all believers who reach the end of their lives, rest, and God will resurrect you into everlasting life. And we have seen that in our last study that the words end of days, actually the words in the original text gives another reading. The word for days is yom, remember? And the plural is yamim with an M, but here it's not M that we have at the end. It's an N, so we have yamin, which represents right, like the right hand of God. We should read, when the time of redemption comes, he will return his right arm to its place. And who's the right arm of God? Yeshua. Yeshua. And they will recognize it, his yad. Right? They will recognize me whom they have pierced. This is the time when all Israel shall be saved. Amen. 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 Let's bow our head in prayer. And so Abba Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We can see it in your word. You are our creator and our counselor, guiding us daily to make wise decisions. You are a comforter in sorrow, pain, and or distress. We praise you for drawing near to us when we draw near to you. You are our Heavenly Father and the Father of fa the fatherless. How great are you and your faithfulness days in and day out. You are our peace, our protector, and the high priest who became my redeemer and sacrificed forever. Amen and amen. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.